Hey everybody, welcome to the Permanente Docs Chat. I'm your host, Alex McDonald. As many of you already know, I practice family medicine and sports medicine here in Fontana, California, as part of the Southern California Permanente Medical Group. So thank you all for joining us or tuning in from wherever you may be watching, listening, driving in the car, just don't crash. Uh, I'm really excited to welcome our guest today, Dr. Eric Gibson. She's an OBGYN at the Southeast Permanente Permanente Medical Group in Georgia. And today is the start of Black Maternal Health Week. And we are gonna be discussing uh, the Kakuna Pregnancy Program, as well as all things uh, when it comes to, to a healthy and equitable uh, maternal care as well too. So if you are watching this live, please feel free to drop questions in the chat. We'll get to as many of them as we can. And so we are gonna jump right in here and, and make sure this is this is high yield and efficient for all of you. So Dr. Gibson, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Dr. McDonald. I'm very happy to be here and always happy to talk about uh, the maternal health crisis and what we're doing to um, address that, especially during this important week, Black Maternal Health Week. So Absolutely. happy to be here. Great. Well, uh, let's start us start by telling us kind of who you are and, and what you do. Sure. Um, well, I'm an OBGYN. Um, I'm a general OBGYN. Um, I practice in Atlanta, Georgia at our Southeast Permanente Medical Group here. Um, I've been with the organization for about six years, previously was in private practice in DC. Um, so was always looking for an opportunity to come back and especially um, an opportunity to be able to do this type of impactful work. Um, in my administrative role, I'm the program director for perinatal safety and quality. Uh, so work with both the women's um, services department and our department of safety and quality um, to ensure that our patients receive the highest quality care. Wonderful. That's that's such a so many important roles that you're playing as well too. So can you can you give us a little background here and discuss why uh, black patients are at higher risk of maternal mor mor mortality and morbidity just in general? Yeah. So I mean, I think that that's sort of the the you know the the gold question right there is why um, you know why do we see these inequities um, in outcomes? And we know, unfortunately, the U.S. Um, among industrialized or developed countries has one of the higher maternal mortality rates and a rate that is increasing, whereas other countries, um, the rates are decreasing. And for our Black women, we see um, that risk of maternal mortality about two to three times higher, um, you know, compared to their white counterparts. And, um, you know, I think when we think about inequities, we sort of think about, you know, maybe some of the, the social drivers for that. Um, so lack of access to care, um, you know, late prenatal care, um, you know, potentially higher risk of um, or higher rates of um, comorbidities of things like chronic hypertension, diabetes, um, you know, but when you look at uh, data, um, you actually see that, um, you know, Black women who have, uh, you know, college or higher degree education um, are at sort of a, an equivalent or still higher risk um, of maternal mortality and morbidity compared to, um, you know, white women with um, sort of less than a high school, um, you know, degree education. So some of those social factors really don't track um, when you look at that, um, at that data. And so it sort of leads us to, um, you know, to, to think about um, uh, racism and, does, and implicit bias and sort of what role that plays um, you know, in uh, patients feeling like their concerns are not heard, um, you know, not receiving timely care. So I think that, you know, that really is sort of the, the root uh, cause, um, you know, because, you know, race is, is a, a social construct and, and our patients are not doing anything, um, you know, differently from um, non-Black patients that um, we really can sort of pinpoint why um, you know, they have a higher maternal mortality rate. Oh, there, there's so much that you just said that I want to respond to, but I think just the first thing is, wow, two to three times higher maternal mortality in the, in the black uh, patient population compared to their white counterparts. That is just mind boggling. I mean, how is that possible in this, in this day and age, in this nation as well too? Um, so I just want to, want to reflect on that. Um, I yeah. think, you know, I, again, I, I, as a family physician, I did a lot of um, uh, prenatal care during residency. I don't do prenatal care any, anymore, but a lot of my family medicine colleagues still do a lot of uh, prenatal care um, and, and labor and delivery. And they will often t 
tell me that a lot of sort of the the, the care is, is within the, the pregnancy is, is sort of algorithmic to some degree, but there's still mm-hmm. a lot of clinical decision making which goes into it. And that's maybe where those biases or some of those those institutional sort of um, uh, racism pieces have been stuck and we, we can't get past that. How again, how is this possible? <laughs> and second of all, how do we, how do we get out of this? And, and, and that may dovetail into my next question about your, your program there. In, uh, uh, in yeah. yeah. You know, and, and I think that, um, you know, you bring up a good point where there are a lot of, you know, sort of algorithms that we follow for routine prenatal care. And I think that that's part of the solution is really standardizing, um, you know, some of the care that we provide to our patients. So, for instance, um, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy is, you know, one of the leading, um, you know, contributors for both maternal morbidity and maternal mortality. So um, preeclampsia, uh, chronic hypertension, um, and we see the bulk of those complications um, happen postpartum. So, you know, I've heard, you know, stories from other colleagues, other patients, you know, even seen in the past where, you know, a patient may um, you know, call in with a headache and elevated blood pressures at home. And in the past, they may have been told to, you know, sort of watch things or, um, you know, follow up in a week. Um, and so one of the things that we have done, you know, knowing that hypertension is such a large contributor to mor- uh, morbidity and mortality, um, is develop protocols and guidelines that are evidence-based where, you know, we really treat and triage all of those patients um, the same. Yep. Um, and then along with that, um, which, you know, sort of talks about the cocoon is uh, that patient education around the signs and symptoms of preeclampsia um, is really baked into sort of every, you know, sort of contact that they have with the healthcare system. So with the nurses, with um, our maternal child health nurses who are seeing the patients postpartum, even some of our, you know, social workers or therapists, um, are, are really making sure that, you know, we grab every opportunity that we can, um, you know, to do that patient education. So they're aware of what to look for, but also when they do have those symptoms, there's not as much room for, um, that wide variation in clinical practice. So we use guidelines and if they meet, you know, criteria for readmission or bringing back to the office, Um, that we sort of really standardize and protocolize how we treat, um, you know, some of these conditions. Yeah. I I mean, that's one of the things I love best about uh, being a permanent day physician is really that the team-based collaborative coordinated care um, and really sort of following these evidence-based guidelines. I remember uh, when I first came here, I've been here uh, with with KP since about 2013. um, I had to kind of get out of the, 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 the habit of when I present a patient mentioning, you know, their, their age, you know, and their ethnicity, um, because that didn't happen here. And I think that's such an important piece that we don't sort of, you know, explicitly or implicit, implicitly bias our, our thoughts, um, based on adding, um, race to, to our, our patient presentations. And I think that's a, something that's really, really important and want to highlight, um, that piece you just touched on as well. Do you have any other thoughts there? Any other sort of systematic changes we can think about? Um, you know, I think that the standardization has really been, um, you know, something that is huge. Um, you know, the other thing that we um, as an organization have done, and I think, you know, Kaiser does very well, um, is being very explicit about, you know, sort of calling out the role implicit bias and systemic racism has, um, you know, in these outcomes. So, um in our department, we, you know, have done implicit bias training and have had, um, you know, some really productive conversations as a department um, to really confront that, um, you know, we have a collegial environment where, you know, even sort of personally, we've, you know, had these types of discussions, um, specifically as they relate to the, you know, maternal morbidity um, and mortality disparate um, outcomes. So I think that, you know, having a very targeted approach of, you know, how we um, have these conversations in our group and have continued um, um, sort of interventions or programs where we can continue to learn how, you know, sort of we as providers may um, sort of come into clinical scenarios, and we all do, 
um, you know, with potential bias and how that may impact um, impact care. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so for those of you who are watching live, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the, the Q&A. We'll try and get to those as well, too. Um, so, Dr. Gibson, let's, let's maybe take a, take a step back here and tell us more about the Kakuna Pregnancy Care Program you have there in uh, the Southern uh, Southeast Permanente Medical Group and that comprehensive maternal care program. Tell us more about that. Sure, sure. So, um, you know, in 2019, we, um, as a department, really kind of took a step back um, and, you know, thought about how we could redesign um, how we deliver, you know, prenatal care, postpartum care. Um, and so there were sort of multiple prongs, um, you know, we used to kind of approach that problem. One um, was really just understanding our, you know, population. So um, really tagging our data analysts and our IT um, team to help build systems so we actually understand who our patients are and what our disease burden is, um, which really helps target interventions and then track, um, you know, sort of certain metrics and outcomes as we implement um, interventions so we can, you know, learn what's working, what's not working. Um, so that was, you know, really key. The other part was, um, as I mentioned, um, really using um, evidence-based protocols, guidelines, you know, looking at, um, you know, sources like the CMQCC and just, you know, California as a state with, with a, a lower maternal mortality rate um, in learning uh, what they're doing. And again, the, the sort of bulk of what they do is toolkits, it's packages, it's protocols, standardized care, um, and, um, you know, sort of writing guidelines based on these, um, you know, this evidence that helps our clinicians, you know, manage these common high-risk um, obstetric conditions so that we're all sort of providing the same care. Um, and then um, establishing high-risk clinics. So we're really targeting our high-risk patients, dedicating enough time to those patients, um, you know, and then thinking about not just sort of the medicine part of care. So there's sort of the physical aspect of care, but, um, you know, sort of those other aspects that contribute, you know, to the care of the whole patient. So socioeconomic um, factors, um, mental health factors, um, and sort of out of that, um, you know, came the cocoon pregnancy model where we think of a cocoon as, you know, something that provides protection, um, you know, for something in a vulnerable state. And so we think of a, you know, pregnant person, um, you know, fetus baby as, you know, being in a vulnerable state requiring mm -hmm. multiple layers of protection. So not just the clinicians, but um, really everyone involved in that patient's care. So in yep. thinking about some of the other sort of prongs, um, you know, the socioeconomic, um, you know, factors we um, advocated and, and uh, were able to uh, get licensed clinical social workers that are really our behavioral health therapists. Mm -hmm. um, so really addressing the mood disorders of pregnancy, even just PTSD from previous, um, you know, sort of deliveries and helping, um, you know, inform trauma-based um, care, uh, pregnancy losses, just anxiety. I think with the, the amount of media attention that's being paid, I think a lot of pregnant women now are scared um, and very anxious to be pregnant. So, you know, they're sort of really helping to, pro, you know, create that bubble around the patient's um, mental health and then um, adding case management to really um, help facilitate those really complicated um, patients and, the, and coordinate their care. A social worker to help address some of those socio um, um, social determinants of health, community navigator, um, dietitian. So really just employing, um, you know, multiple resources uh, to really kind of address every sort of aspect um, of care that that patient may need. Yeah, yeah. I, I've said it before, I'll, I'll say it again, and I will continue to say that medicine is a team-based sport and it really requires <laughs> everyone collaborating, working together to really help support the patient from, from every different aspect. I think this is such a perfect example of that too. Um, real quick, you use an, a, a, a uh, uh, CMQCC or, or some, what, what does that stand for? Oh, yes. So that's the California Medical Quality Collaborative. Okay. Um, so it is a, a, essentially a huge team of people um, that really help put together these toolkits. So, um, you know, ranging from hemorrhage toolkits, hypertension toolkits, 
um, promoting vaginal birth toolkit. So it's just um, sort of consolidating a lot of the evidence um, around how to manage, you know, these sort of conditions and um, protocols for the hospital. So it's using those um, evidence-based protocols and guidelines um, to, you know, sort of incorporate into how we manage patients. Great. Yeah, there, there are so many TLAs in medicine. <laughs> there are, yes. <laughs> Three letter acronym. So that, that, actually, <laughs> that actually dovetails nicely into our next question. Is the cocoon pregnancy uh, model practiced in all the Permanente regions or is it is it just there in Georgia? Tell, or is there is there ways to expand it? Are there plans to expand it? Tell us more. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that we um, as a region were the first to sort of term the concept of, you know, this multidisciplinary approach, um, you know, to managing our patients. But um, I think that there are versions of the cocoon model in all regions. And we actually looked at the mid-Atlantic region because demographically our patient population is very similar. Um, You know, we looked at their region, looked at other regions and really learned, um, you know, what some of the other Kaiser regions were doing Um, you know, to expand that care team um, to really help drive outcomes. So we learned from other regions how to, you know, sort of piece all of this together. Um, And there actually are, we have talked about, you know, how to expand, you know, the cocoon because, you know, I don't think, um, you know, the model is completely, completely expansive. And some of the things that we, um, you know, talked about including were, um, you know, we, it's a, it's a very, um, healthcare sort of organization centered, you know, kind of viewpoint of the patient. Um, And obviously the, you know, patient spends like 99.9% more of their time outside of the four walls of a medical facility. Um, So including, you know, their partners or family support, um, you know, because I think they're really instrumental in advocating for the patient. and, you know, helping to form their, you know, their support, um, you know, looking at community organizations and how, you know, community organizations, especially given the strain on healthcare systems now and sort of strapped resources, mm-hmm. um, you know, how we can lean on organizations that are already in the community that the patient, um, you know, may sort of identify better with or feel more comfortable with. Um, and so those are um, just sort of some ways that we've thought about expanding the cocoon model um, to sort of extend beyond, you know, just the healthcare setting. Yeah. I, and a lot of patients, let's be honest, don't necessarily trust the institutional systems of sure. healthcare. We don't always have the greatest history, quite frankly, and sort of acknowledging sure. that and finding maybe those trusted messengers where the patients can relate better than, than their doctor or their health plan sometimes. Well, yeah, too. absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, what you, you kind of touched on this sort of empowering the, the patient, empowering their their family members to sort of advocate. I know sometimes, um, you know, as, as physicians, we just sort of expect patients to listen to our advice and do what we say. How can patients who maybe are at higher risk uh, really advocate for themselves in in an effective way um, without making everyone angry at them? Quite frankly, because let's be let's be honest, it can be it can be challenging. But sometimes those patients. They're, they're, they're the experts on their bo- own body. And sometimes they know there's something wrong before anyone, anyone else does, quite frankly. So how can we help empower our patients and our family members um, to advocate for themselves? Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, especially now that we have um, loosened some of the restrictions with COVID, um, you know, having, um, you know, a family member, partner, support person, um, you know, be present for um, visits so that they are able to hear the same thing that patients are hearing, um, you know, can ask questions. Um, You know, I think that there are some, you know, good community resources, um, you know, that really sort of help with um, empowering patients and their voices. I think, um, you know, if we have the opportunity to employ, um, you know, doulas or kind of community mothers, resource mothers, just people in the community that, um, again, the patient may, feel more comfortable with sort of advocating um, on their behalf. Um, I think that those are, are folks that, you know, really can help um, advocate advocate for patients. Um, you know, I think when patients are, are educated and, um, you know, sort of uh, aware of what to look for or what to even advocate for, 
um, you know, I think that that also um, is very empowering, which is why we, um, you know, have really focused um, a lot on, you know, just very, um, you know, consistent communication, education, really across all boards. Um, you know, and I think that the the patient advocacy is very, very important. Um, you know, I think that sometimes in, in sort of these discussions, there's a lot of emphasis placed on patient advocacy. Um, and my hope is that with, you know, sort of developing programs like the Cocoon Pregnancy Model, where there are a lot of supports, um, you know, the patient is educated, um, you know, but we also have safety, you know, sort of systems in place with protocols and guidelines, um, yeah. you know, that we're less reliant on the patient to, you know, sort of push and advocate for themselves. I think that's like a cherry on the top, but definitely, yeah. um, you know, not, um, not sort of the main driver for, you know, sort of turning this tide. Yeah, no, I think that's a really, really important point. Um, there was a question here in the chat also. For the cocoon model, does it go uh, postpartum? Does it go six weeks postpartum or eight weeks postpartum? How, how long after the delivery does the, does the program continue? Yeah, yeah. So that's a really good question. You know, we've sort of recognized that the fourth trimester is that postpartum period and is just as vulnerable a time, if not maybe more so than when the patient is pregnant. And, um, you know, we do see a, a large percentage of, um, you know, even maternal deaths um, occur postpartum. So we've been very intentional about, um, you know, really bolstering the support postpartum. And the duration of that really depends on sort of what the patient's needs are. Um, you know, we have the ability to, you know, follow patients with, um, you know, case management or social work up to a year postpartum. Um, you know, be, we have our, um, behavioral health therapists and, you know, they're following patients for, um, you know, three months um, up to a year postpartum. Wow. Um, but generally, yeah, if our patients are requiring um, sort of that intense of, um, you know, therapy or monitoring with our behavioral health therapists, um, we like to sort of plug them into just our sort of regular behavioral health therapists since they may need more long-term therapy. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but they do serve as that bridge, um, you know, if the patient just has more need, um, just so that we ensure that that all of our patients have access to our therapists. Yeah, that's, that's, it's wonderful that there's no sort of end point, it just whatever the patient needs, we help try to provide it for them. That's such an important piece. Um, I, I love the term fourth trimester also, it's a bit of an oxymoron, but it's better than saying the quarters, right? The quarters of pregnancy. <laughs> trimester. Yeah. yeah. I, I do. Okay. Last question. We could go on and on. This is wonderful. Sure. Um, you want to keep this high, high yield. My last question is what makes you most proud to be a permanent day physician? Um, I mean, I think that this program and the ability to, um, you know, identify a need um, and really rally and be able to, to um, you know, advocate for what our patients need and have the organization respond um, to be able to offer, you know, such a comprehensive, you know, program to our patients. Um, you know, that's one thing that makes me really proud. And then um, an organization, as I mentioned before, that has been very, you know, vocal um, and very supportive of, um, you know, looking at um, implicit bias and, you know, in medicine and how we can really um, you know, really actually address that. So um, those are the two, probably the two main things that make me proud to be a permanent day physician. Wonderful. Well, well, thank you so much for joining us. I know you're doing other uh, events this week as well too. So make sure <laughs> you stay tuned for all the, the events across all the different um, uh, Kaiser Permanente regions regarding uh, a Black Maternal Health Week and make sure we provide equitable care uh, for all of our patients as well. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Gibson. Really appreciate thank your time. You. Yeah, thank you. This was great.